So, as I said earlier, if I, I had designed the program, I might have started with Philemon, uh, just because it being one page, it is a very easy way to step into the idea of letter writing in the first century. I think the editors of the program, the folks who designed it, stuck it with um, Colossians and Ephesians, in part because it has to go somewhere, and you can't have a whole talk, you know, hour-long talk, um, 20 verses, but also because Onesimus, that name appears. Onesimus, whose name appeared in the letter to the Colossians. And in verse, 20, verse 23, Epaphras. Epaphras was the apostle who founded the church in Colossae. So I think that too is why, uh, I guess I would have put Colossians and Philemon together and then a separate lecture on Ephesians, but so be it. Here's the background. First, we don't know the date. We can only guess at the destination because Onesimus and Epaphras appear in the letter to the Colossians that likely it's in that area that this letter is addressed. It's a personal letter, more personal than any of the other letters that we have read. The background is this. The person addressed, and I call him Philemon, Philemon, that's the Greek pronunciation. People say Philemon, that's fine too. You know, is it Paris or is it Paris? Well, it, it, yes, the answer is yes. So if I say Philemon, don't, don't freak out on me. And don't feel you've got to use the same name, the same pronunciation. Philemon is a person of wealth. He is the, he is the, um, head, his house is being used by a body of Christians. So there is a sense, a church that meets in his house. So he's a person of means. He has had, he has a slave. A slave who has done something and run away or just run away. Um, slaves, remember, are property. Ancient Roman slave keeping was not ethnic. It's not like American slave keeping, which was based on your ethnicity. Blacks were no better than to be slaves. A lot of Greeks, a lot of various kinds of people could end up being slaves if their side lost in a war, or they ran into debt, um, or they were criminals. So while no one wants to be a slave, uh, slavery does, did, does not in the ancient world have the same smell about it as 19th century or 16th through 19th century uh, Negro slavery in the United States. But in any case, when Onesimus, the slave, again, either he either breaks something or, or does something he shouldn't do and runs away, o Onesimus, when he leaves, he is taking Philemon's property, mainly himself, away. He's stealing his property. Paul is in prison. Again, that's a link to Colossians. Paul and Ephesians, Paul, those are all called, they're all called prison letters because Paul writes them from prison. And somehow uh, Philemon, I'm sorry, Onesimus has come in contact with Paul. Uh, did he know, did, did Onesimus run away going to Paul? He knows Paul is under house arrest or in prison and he wants to go and throw himself and ask for Paul's help. Onesimus becomes or confesses Christian faith. And, and, and now Paul writes Philemon and without explicitly demanding it, hints in 20 different ways that Paul wants Philemon not to punish his runaway slave. In fact, to receive him or welcome him back as a Christian brother. Paul uses a great deal of art and cleverness in his writing. So let's just kind of launch in. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, so there's a co-writer, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, 
Again, notice that title, fellow worker. That's one that Paul used in Romans when addressing a number of Roman Christians who had been part of his apostolic band. So Paul honors Philemon by giving him a title of a co-worker. And Aphia, our sister. Now, who's Aphia? Aphia might be Philemon's wife. Uh, could be his sister. Probably his wife, though, because there's also Archippus, our fellow soldier. And so the guess, a guess is, is that Aphia is Philemon's wife, and Archippus is perhaps their son. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a personal letter. Notice that Philemon appears in the New Testament after the letters to Timothy and Titus. I mentioned it in passing that whoever pulled together the body of Paul's letters arranged them in two groups. First, the letters addressed to churches, to groups. That's Romans through Thessalonians. And then the letters to individuals. Okay, and that's 1 Timothy to Philemon. And then within each group, according to size. That's how Romans gets to be first. Not because Paul put it first or thought of it as the, as the grandest letter. It's the longest letter to a church. And Philemon is last because it's the shortest letter to an individual. Paul begins with, as he does always, with his thanksgiving. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith with which you have toward the Lord Jesus and all his saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. So a wonderful upbuilding word of, of uh, positivity and, uh, and, and goodness as Paul thanks God for Philemon. I, verse 7, I have dis derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, and because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Follow in that word refresh. It's Paul's going to repeat it in the end. There is a, a quality of letter of, of any literature in the ancient world. And I think I've used the word before, and you'll hear me use it again. It's called chiasm. The Greek letter CH looks like that. You'd say an X, huh? And if this is A, this is B, this is B prime, and this is A prime. So the first term appears at the end, and then the middle term appears inside, penultimately, before the end. So it's called A, B, B, A. That's called a chiasm. A chiasm. The ancients loved doing that, and Paul does it frequently. And the Old Testament prophets do it too. So it's a way of making an argument on paper that is, is winsome and makes people say how clever you are. Anyway, Paul thanks Philemon, thanks God, how, for how Philemon's example, maybe his housing the church, has been an, an uh, uh, example that has led to refreshment among the saints. Verse 8 begins the body. So we have letter opening, 1 through 3. We have thanksgiving, 4 through 7. We have body. This is the classic pattern of a Pauline letter. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake... I prefer to appeal to you. So Paul, on the one hand, will say, I have the right to push you around and order you, Philemon, but I would rather be gentle and have you do the right thing for the right reason. So, so Paul open-handedly hints. This is this the first example of the hinting. There'll be several other examples. And yet Paul will lean on Philemon to do the right thing. Verse Nine. I, Paul, an ambassador, now a prisoner for Christ, I appeal to you for my child, in air quotes, Onesimus, whose father, in air quotes, I have become in my imprisonment. Again, don't think of Roman prisons like uh, state prisons in Wisconsin. Uh, 
Uh, it's more like house arrest. Uh, the being imprisoned was was not usually the the final destination. We house people in prison. That's their punishment. Uh, the ancients used prisons as places uh, to keep you during a trial or before the sentence, which might have been death, or might be being sent to the to work in the mines or being exiled or to pay a fine. So it, it could be. It could be that Paul's imprisonment is more like a house arrest. He's monitored with a bracelet or something. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, and now he is indeed useful to you and to me. There's a little play on words there. The name Onesimus, for the word Onesimus, means useful. It's a it's a, it's a typical slave name, you know, the useful one. Uh, he's a machine. So Paul plays on that idea of useless, useful. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. So Philemon is getting the message that Paul really, really treasures Onesimus, sending his heart. Verse 14, I preferred uh, verse, um, verse 13, I would have been glad to keep him, but I, but I won't do it against without, without forcing you. He says in verse 14, I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but by your own free will. Now, isn't that, I mean, after talking about how Paul is in prison, and Paul, how Paul is the ambassador uh, for Christ, and and after all the praise that Paul has, has, has poured out on uh, Philemon, you, you can feel the pressure that Philemon is under to do what Paul is hinting at. Then Paul goes and says, well, maybe, and maybe this was part of God's plan, that whatever happened at your house, whatever Onesimus did, and whatever he ran away, was somehow so that he would come to me and, and he would be fully uh, received in faith and baptized. So now I return him to you not as a slave, but as a fellow Christian. So again, verse 15, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Remember I said, how Paul uses that flesh-spirit dichotomy. Flesh is not just meat. It's not just your, your uh, appetite for food and pleasure and sexual uh, uh, expression. It, it is to do things apart from God. So Paul says how, how then you should receive him as, uh, in, in, as both in the flesh, on a secular side, and in the Lord. So here comes the big wrap up. So if you consider me your partner, okay, remember how in the opening of verse one, Paul hailed Philemon as a fellow worker. So now in verse 17, Paul says, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Now there's the big ask, but Paul leans even harder. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Then Paul grabs the, the stylus from the stenographer, from the secretary, and writes, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your own owing me even your own self. So like we sent a check, you know, which, which, which gives the bank permission to pass the money, Paul signs this letter, but then adds, adds the, the pressure by saying, not to say that, that I'll take on this debt, but, but you owe your faith to me, Philemon. Verse 20. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Back in verse 7, I made a big deal how Paul thanks God for how Philemon's example has refreshed the saints now Paul wants a little bit of that love, that refreshment for himself. Verse 21. Confident of your obedience. Now back in verse 14, he said he would never order 
But now, now he acts as if it's a sure thing. Confident of your obedience, I write to you. And then to add one more little brick on the load, Paul asks that, that, that Philemon prepare a room for him in his house. Because when Paul gets out, he's going to come visit. How embarrassing would that be if Philemon has still keeps Ones has punished Onesimus? You know, a, a runaway slave could have his, his word, the name Dulos, slave, uh, uh, branded on his forehead, could have his ear cut off or an arm cut off, uh, could be sold or sent away. So there's lots of things an owner could do to a runaway slave. But Paul says, I'm going to come visit. So guess what Paul's going to look for uh, when he gets there? Verse 23. Epaphras. Again, this is the same man we saw in Colossians. My fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demos, Luke, who are all my fellow workers. And then comes the conclusion. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Interestingly, that phrase, your, is plural at the end. Um, and, and, and so while this is a personal letter, at some level, uh, go back to the, to the greeting, verse 2, as Paul lists those he's addressing. So there's Philemon, Aphia, Archippus, and the church in your house. So Paul greets the church in who meets in the house. So this is a personal letter, but it has a little bit of a public envelope, which again might serve to put more pressure on Paul. I find this just fascinating, just a fascinating window into Paul's vision and cleverness. You know, would that Paul had actually ordered it? You know, we, you, you can't blame Paul for this. Philemon was a letter that was much loved, again, uh, like the Noah story when they get off the ark. Remember how uh, Ham uh, laughs at his naked father who's drunk in the tent, and then when Noah wakes up, he curses not Ham, but Ham's offspring, Canaan. That passage from Genesis 9 was a favorite of preachers in the South in the first half of the 19th century, because it seemed to justify black slavery. Paul gets right up to the edge, but doesn't order Philemon. And preachers use that too as an example. Paul does not order Paul. I mean, Paul does not order Philemon to, to, to not ha have a slave. Uh, he, he gets close to it, but, but won't go there. Uh, would that he had. This was, this was Paul's perfect opportunity. I think, I think he does everything but that. I mean, he's, he's bending over backwards to put pressure on Philemon to do the right thing. See it from Philemon's side. Hmm? He's a man of means and a Christian. How and, and, and his slave has run away. Maybe has stolen something or broken something or, or assaulted somebody in the family and that's why he's run away. We don't know that. As a person of means and authority and power in his community, Philemon has every right to punish the slave. If Philemon welcomes the slave back, if instead of cutting off his ear, he sets him free, if instead of, of, of wood-burning uh, doulos, slave, on his forehead, he worships with him in a common worship service as a Christian, what will Philemon's neighbors think? <laughs> First, they'll be, a, they'll be a little offended because word will get out that Philemon treated his runaway slave like a friend. What kind of discord and disruption is that going to cause in the, the houses of the other well-to-do people in whatever city? When slaves hear how Philemon handled this. So Philemon finds himself in a tough spot, a costly spot. 
he, on the one hand, is going to be, lose money because if he lets Onesimus go, um, that's he bought Onesimus, or he's, or, or you know, Onesimus counts for money, and he's going to lose Philemon. Will he's going to lose some respect of his peers, his upper class neighbors. So Philemon discovers here something that we all have to discover. That this Jesus thing, if you take it seriously, is going to cost you. It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you fitting in with the boys. Uh, th this is Philemon's problem. And what makes this letter even though it's short, I think uh, a tremendous, a tremendous uh, witness, full of life and vitality for the Christian way. There are other letters, of course, ascribed to Paul, uh, but we are done now in year two with Paul. We will come back to the so-called pastorals. We will read them in year four. They also bear Paul's name, but 90% of, maybe 95% maybe of scholars uh, see uh, the, the pastoral letters to Timothy and Titus as maybe having some scraps of Paul, but really written in a different time by different characters. So we, this ends unit two. What's going to be coming next is in the remaining unit, we're going to go back and we're going to, we're going to read two other uh, large, important documents of the New Testament. Um, one that you love and know well, that's the Gospel of John, and the other, the Book of Revelation, which you don't love and you don't know well, but has had an oversized reaction or oversized uh, emphasis in the story of the church. So, uh, bid Paul adieu. I hope this introduction to Paul has changed your attitude towards him a little bit. He's rich. He is. The, he is a genius. He. He. Remember his big idea. His big idea is the idea of grace, God's grace to us that we access through faith. So next time, we start with the Gospel of John.